Lord God, thank you for forgiveness and mercy. Lead us to be forgiving and merciful. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, I'll preach on the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18. It's a parable about forgiveness. I'll preach about forgiveness, and then we'll explore the deeper meaning of this parable and apply it to today. The parable starts when Peter approaches Christ and asks, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? We need to stop there. Rabbis during Christ's time taught that people should forgive their offenders, but only three times. Peter, trying to look especially generous, asked Jesus if seven, the perfect number, was enough times to forgive someone. Peter is saying, I'm going to double it. More than double it, I'll add one more and make it seven. Look, I'm generous with forgiveness, but Jesus, do you have a limit? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, meaning that we shouldn't even keep track of how many times we forgive someone. We should always forgive those who are truly repentant, no matter how many times they ask. Colossians 3 verse 13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has any grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. The first question in our staff meeting on Tuesday, as we read this parable, it became the elephant in the room, and it is with this parable. Yes, we all agreed that you should forgive people who are truly sorry and repentant, but should we also forgive people who don't repent, who aren't sorry for their offense? Should you forgive people who have no remorse? What about them? Yes. We should also forgive people who are unrepentant, people who don't say, I'm sorry. Jesus did it from the cross. He demonstrated this for us when he cried out to his Father in heaven, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. Christ forgave the people who sentenced him, who executed him, though he did no wrong. They weren't sorry, they weren't remorseful, and they were not repentant. But he forgave them nonetheless. When you forgive someone from the heart, you will have freedom from anger and resentment. It benefits you. Ah, but they didn't say, I'm sorry. They didn't apologize. Forgive them. It's for your good. Forgiveness liberates the victim, and if you're the victim of an offense, it will liberate you. It sets you free from the pesky grudge and the hard feelings that build up. Grudges and hard feelings mutate like cancer into deep remorse and hatred, which is absolutely unhealthy for your soul and for your future. They didn't say, I'm sorry, so I'm going to take revenge. No. You say, well, I'm going to give them some of their own medicine and see how they like it. No. That only makes the problem worse. A war of offenses leaves a wake of destruction that harms others, including you. Instead of taking revenge, Christ teaches us to love and pray for our enemies. Paul taught the same thing when he said, overcome evil with good. In Romans chapter 12, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. When you forgive and don't take revenge, it leaves the offender shocked, stunned. It leaves the question, why? That's an opportunity to show Jesus Christ and the power of the gospel. I forgive you because God forgave me. But pastor, are you saying that we should forgive and act like nothing happened? Many people confuse forgiveness and forgetting. 
I want to give you a few situations when the Christian will forgive but not forget. When a husband commits adultery against his wife, when he cheats on her, she should forgive him, but she won't forget. Trust is broken. She will protect her heart and remember what he did so that she isn't hurt again. The Christian wife will forgive him because she loves God and wants to honor and obey God. And maybe they'll work it out. God can certainly reconcile the relationship, but the husband will have to earn her trust again because that trust is gone. So when you forgive someone, realize that there are still consequences. Similarly, we forgive and support justice. The man who drinks while driving and kills someone walking across the road, that's a crime. The rule of law must deliver justice against the offender. The justice system doesn't forget what the drunk driver did. The family grieving the death of their loved one who has been killed, they should forgive the drunk driver from the heart. But the same family should also support justice to help prevent such a tragedy from happening again. Take the war in Ukraine. The tyrannical, evil, brutal leader, Vladimir Putin, has waged war against Ukraine, completely unprovoked by Ukraine. Putin has killed innocent civilians, men, women, and children, all to get what he wants, what doesn't belong to him. Ukraine must forgive Putin. But they have every right, with God's blessing, to defend themselves, defend their borders, and their independence. They will forgive, but they won't forget, so that future generations have the same blessing of independence and freedom. They know what it takes to defend freedom. It's the anniversary of 9-11, this Sunday, 22 years We forgive the terrorists, but we will never forget, so that it never happens again. Those are some instances forgiveness happens without forgetting. The late Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote, Forgiveness is not forgetting. On the contrary, it is important to remember so that we should not let such atrocities happen again. This is where the two kingdoms of God comes in. Understanding the two kingdoms makes sense of forgiveness and justice. Government and church is an oversimplified way of understanding these two kingdoms, but it helps us to make sense of the concept. The kingdom on the right is where God rules with the gospel of Jesus Christ, setting people free from their sins, guilt, shame, and darkness. God forgives. The kingdom on the left is where God uses the law. And the kingdom on the right is where God uses the gospel. The kingdom on the left is where God rules with the sword, punishing evil. And the kingdom on the right is where God rules with his powerful word, forgiving sinners and establishing morality. God's purpose in the left-hand kingdom is to bring about justice. His purpose on the right is to bring about justification. Justification means making sinners right with God. The kingdom on the left is always working toward peace, while the kingdom on the right has peace now. We have peace in Jesus Christ because Christ has made peace for us with God through his sacrifice for our sins. God has established both kingdoms. And he is active. He's at work in both of them, bringing about his good purpose for the world. There is forgiveness and there is justice. We must not get them confused. Jesus himself made clear the distinction between these two kingdoms when some spies asked him, is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus said to him, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Christians are citizens of both kingdoms. We have dual citizenship. We forgive and we defend justice. 
we are citizens of the United States of America, where we live under the rule of law. We are also citizens of the kingdom of heaven, where we live according to the word of God and practice our faith by worshiping and serving God and forgiving people. God cares equally about both kingdoms. Christians should be the best citizens of both kingdoms. Exercise your right to vote in the upcoming November election. Vote your Christian conscience. And forgive your neighbor when your neighbor sins against you because you live in the kingdom of heaven. You have been forgiven much, so forgive much. To explain how serious it is to forgive your neighbor, Jesus tells a parable of an unforgiving servant. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As the king began the settlement, a man who owed him millions of dollars was brought to him. We'll talk about the large amount in a moment. The servant was not able to pay the debt, so the king ordered that he, his wife, his children, and all of his belongings be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell to his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The king took pity on him, showed mercy, canceled the debt, and let it go. He let the man go. His family and all of his children and belongings were back to him. The king canceled millions of dollars in debt. The king showed great mercy, and God has forgiven our debts as well. Well over millions of dollars. It helps if you take an inventory of your sins just to see how much he's forgiven you. Because then it really sinks in, and you begin to understand how much he loves you. We generalize sin, we generalize forgiveness, and it starts to lose its meaning. There's an evangelist named Ray Comfort. He has YouTube videos about his conversations on the street with people, sharing the gospel with them. He always begins by asking, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen anything? Well, everyone has sinned. It leaves the person in a place of hopelessness, ready to hear the good news of forgiveness, to hear the good news of hope. Much more than millions of dollars, Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, paid for every specific sin of mine and yours on the cross with his precious and holy blood. My debt and your debt is fully canceled, paid in full. And how should I respond toward those who sin against me? I have been forgiven much, so I must forgive much. I have been forgiven like millions of dollars spiritually. I should forgive someone who owes me a few thousand dollars spiritually. Look at what happens in the parable. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. That's shocking, isn't it? His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, Be patient with me, and I will pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and told the king everything that had happened. The king called the unforgiving servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? The king forgave millions of dollars. The unforgiving servant is unwilling to forgive a few thousand dollars. In anger, the king turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. Then Christ explains the punchline of the parable. He tells us the main point. 
He says it to Peter and to all of us. This is how my heavenly Father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from the heart. So how many times should you forgive someone without limit and freely from the heart? The disciples' willingness to forgive should be like God's willingness to forgive. His grace, his limitless grace. Those who do not forgive in this way, they have not fully experienced God's forgiveness. This is how much I've been forgiven by God. As far as the east is from the west, and this is how much I must forgive my neighbor. Psalm 103, verse 12, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And if I'm unwilling to forgive a small fraction of what God has forgiven me, I have a heart problem. I have a deep spiritual problem. And it makes God angry when we withhold forgiveness. The king represents God, and he's angry when the unforgiving servant refuses to show mercy. I've done this for you, says the king, millions of dollars in forgiveness, and you won't forgive your neighbor's debt? Let's admit it. Sometimes forgiving someone is really difficult. This is when we must ask God for help. We must ask for a heart change. We must pray, self-reflect, and draw near to the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, I'm being honest with you. I don't want to forgive them. But I know what you say. I know what you teach. The hurt runs deep inside. So I ask you to help me forgive them. Change my heart and heal my pain. And he will. He can relate with your pain. He can relate with you completely. Remember, Jesus is fully human and fully God. Fully human means he understands how we feel. From the cross, his enemies scoffed at him. He'll change your heart with his love. He'll lead you to love even your enemies. It may not happen immediately, but he will do the work. The Holy Spirit will work in your heart to soften your heart and to lead you to love as Christ has loved you. Forgiveness will liberate you. Forgiveness will set you free from the prison of hurt, anger, and hatred. Whoever has been forgiven much forgives much, Jesus taught. And when you truly understand and accept the cross, for what it is, what Christ has done for you, you will want to forgive your neighbor from the heart. Christ loves that person who offended you. Christ died for that offender. And the love of Christ is in you and it compels you to love your neighbor. Every neighbor. How can I withhold forgiveness when I have been forgiven for all eternity? There's a woman in the Gospel of Luke who anoints Jesus' feet with perfume. Christ acknowledges her and says to his disciples and all of us, Therefore, I tell you, because her many sins have been forgiven, she has loved much. But he who has been forgiven little loves little. So we have not been forgiven little. We have been forgiven much. We're like the woman anointing Christ's feet. Our many sins have been forgiven, and we love much. In the parable, the unforgiving servant owed the king millions of dollars. The original Greek from the verse is literally 10,000 talents, which is 375 tons of silver, 340 metric tons of silver. The talent was the highest unit of currency in Israel, but its value fluctuated like all currencies. The debt was clearly enormous, impossible to pay, and this amount exceeded the tax revenue of Galilee. 
the exaggerated debt and the servant's promise amplify the greatness of the king's mercy and the servant's unforgiving attitude. God desires mercy, not sacrifice. That's a lesson from this parable. Being merciful is a trademark of the Christian life. The unforgiving servant refused to show mercy, refused to forgive the debt of 100 denarii. 100 denarii was equivalent to a few thousand dollars. A denarius was equivalent to a laborer's full day's wage. The first servant's debt was about one million times greater than this sum owed to him. A million to one. Jesus uses that to help provide the shock value of this parable. Our sin is like those 10,000 talents. God paid it all in full, and we are debt-free. The record is clear. Your spiritual credit report, it's impeccable. The king represents God. The king sent the unmerciful servant to prison to be tortured until he should pay the entire debt. And the servant could never repay that debt. So it's permanent. Prison and torture is thus a metaphor for hell. So here's the main point. Forgive just as the Lord has forgiven you. And Christ is serious about this. This is what we pray in the Lord's Prayer. And do we mean it? Lord, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do you mean that when you pray it? We should mean it and not just go through the motions of saying the prayer. Who do you need to forgive? Let's get specific. A boss, a spouse, a relative, yourself. Sometimes forgiving yourself is the hardest person to forgive. Do you have any grudges? The danger is that we think Jesus is talking about someone else in this parable. That's me, and that's you, when we withhold forgiveness. It's a call to forgive your neighbor, no matter what. Have you ever noticed that the people who knew that they had a big debt followed Jesus? The tax collectors and sinners were drawn to him. Why is that? Well, Jesus projected a view of God as merciful and forgiving, not spiteful, angry, and vengeful like the Pharisees projected. Those who thought they didn't have any debt, the self-righteous Pharisees and religious leaders, they had a problem with Jesus. Jesus would often begin miracles forgiving sins. And the religious leaders would get furious. Jesus revealed God's true nature. Quick to forgive, quick to show mercy. This is from Matthew's Gospel. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, said Jesus. Psalm 145, verse 8, The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. And Micah chapter 7, Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. And notice that Jesus said to forgive from the heart. What does that mean to forgive from the heart? It means it goes deep into your soul, that you completely cancel the grudge entirely. And if it takes you going to your neighbor, going to your offender, and telling them, I forgive you, then do it. To forgive from the heart means to cancel and to let it go. Give it to God. It doesn't mean you forget, as we talked about earlier, but you cancel the debt in your heart for your own good. Not to let it have any weight inside so that you can move forward with God and you can move forward with your life. Look at the word in the middle of forgiveness. What do you see? Give. Give it freely. Be merciful just as God has been merciful to you. 
Lord, thank you for forgiving our enormous debt. We hear and accept your call to forgive from the heart. We love you, God. Amen.